So, um, yeah, I'm from Melbourne Uni, based at the Burnley campus, and um, my collaborators, Dario Stefanelli, who's at um, AgriBio, and also John Presti, who's also there. Now, um, I've also added Rizwan Khan, who's my master's student, and um, he is basically doing all the grunt work, all the, uh, mind you, I'm doing the grunt work too, but so is, so is Rizwan, and that'll be forming his master's project. Um, and uh, Rizwan is actually, he's from Pakistan and he um, actually works at, as a horticulturist in Pakistan advising apple growers on when to harvest. So it's kind of the perfect project for him. Uh, but over there they just use the traditional days after flowering with, with harvest. So we are looking at this, um, we don't have a pointer I think, oh, yeah. um, a, a maturity index meter. To, um, to look at this, and that's really the uh, novel part of this uh, work. So we are looking at rosy glow apples for this project, and for those of you who don't know, and I tell me if I'm preaching to the converted, I'll save some time. Um, Pink lady apples, um, as you probably know, were uh, discovered in Australia. Rosy glow is a sport of that, so it was branch mutation, um, found in the 90s in South Australia. And it was used because Pink lady, um, is, is quite difficult to get to the right amount of colour that the supermarkets will accept. It's got to be, say, between 50 and 60% of colour for, say, Coles um, Safeway to accept it. Rosy Glow is a much redder apple, so it ripens um, more quickly than Pink Lady. And this project came out of a previous master's student's work that I had last year. And we actually were comparing Pink Lady and Rosy Glow because as you probably are aware, industry tends to treat the two as the same because, okay, one's just, you know, a sport of the other, pretty much they're the same. But we found that they're actually quite different and the um, rosy glow doesn't store as well. It produces more ethylene in storage, even if you're giving a smart fresh or MCP treatment to stop that happening. So this project is focusing on looking at um, maturity levels with, with uh, rosy glow. And so... <coughs> Why um, determining maturity is important for several reasons. When is that optimal harvest time? You know, you've got this narrow sort of window that growers are trying to get the apples off their tree and you've got all these complicating factors with um, temperature, etc. Um, and growers are putting um, a maturity treatment, they're spraying with ethyl, which is, um, or ethyl or and one of the other um, similar type of things. It's, it's, um, it's a chemical that will induce ethylene formation in the, in the plant. So it's basically going to speed up their maturity um, just so that they can get the apples off the tree earlier, so you're getting to the market earlier, etc. But, you know, <laughs> what's, what is the effect of maturity on that ethyl treatment? Of course, when you harvest, if you harvest too late, you're not going to have your apples in storage for as long. And um, you know, we're, we're probably finishing off with some apples that have been in storage up to 11 months, depending which cultivar we're looking at. But easily we're looking at you know, at least eight months in storage. So we get that year-round supply that consumers demand. <coughs> now, there's a bit of a you know, mishmash going on here because you've got various post-harvest um, storage disorders. and for example, superficial scald is um, more pronounced if you tend to harvest too early, to be, the apples aren't quite mature enough, whereas internal browning is a storage disorder that is evident if you've harvested too late. And the internal browning will really only show up about, you know, we're probably looking five, six months into the storage. So an internal, internally browned apple um, will look fine on the surface. The consumer gets it and it, um, you can actually see these strands, the radial strands, it's all different types, but um, you can see the browning in there. So it's not a good thing you know, for, for the growers to, to have. So there's a bit of a conundrum there, when to harvest. <coughs> now I said to you that the growers use ethyl, so that's sort of like fake ethylene treatment to bring the ethylene on. But once those apples have been harvested, they actually want to then put them into storage and stop that ethylene process. So that's when they use 1-MCP, um, the chemical name 1-methylcyclopropene, it's also um, SmartFresh, you may know it as. <coughs> when do they treat with SmartFresh and is it going to be affected by the um, particular stage of maturity? 
And of course, if you've got an apple, for example, as I said, rosy glow, pink lady, they're all put in the same, same big bins at Coles. They're not separated at all. And they are different from what we found last year. So you've got a consumer that bites into, selects the reddest apple because we're all kind of, you know, naturally think, oh yeah, the redder apple is better for us. And that's probably the rosy glow apple. And if that one hasn't, um, you know, been picked at the right time, etc., it's not going to be as, as nice an apple to, to uh, bite into. It's not as firm, the sugars are different, etc. So that's really important along the whole supply chain. And of course, brand quality is so important for Pink Lady because you know growers are paying for this Pink Lady brand and it's marketed worldwide. In fact, in the um, Paris trade fair, there was this whole, there was the most popular stand was um, the Pink Lady. And so it's a real big thing overseas. So we want to keep that, um, keep that um, market. And you know, PayPal does as an investment in this, obviously, as well. So the DA meter, <clears throat> it's, um, I guess, you know, you can say, what is the DA meter? It's an image of it down the right-hand side. I tend to think of it really as just the difference in absorbance levels. So um, here we're looking at chlorophyll A content in um, just underneath the skin. And two, um, two wavelengths here, 720, 670 nanometers. That amount of chlorophyll changes as maturity happens, as the fruit ripens. And why we know about this is because Dario did his PhD uh, with Professor Costa, who is at the University of Bologna in Italy. And Dario was visiting his old PhD supervisors, said, oh, you know, what's new, what's up? And he said, oh, I've got this, you know, DA meter that I've just invented. And, well, I guess previous versions of this had been around for a few years, but he's got this nice, as you can see, handheld meter, and you can, um, it's non-destructive, so you can repeatedly, you can test your fruit and, and monitor that over time. Whereas previously, the growers would have to actually do a destructive test, they cut their apple in half and they do the iodine dip, so the starch plates as the grower calls them. And I've got a photo of that um, later on. <coughs> So Daria brought this back to Australia and um, we did this work last year. It was, you know, as I said, sort of pilot work last year because there were a few, oh, is it going to work? And oh, it seems to be sort of specific to certain areas. So this is what we're trying to develop um, for this year. Um, and not only can you decide, okay, this is when we need to harvest and these particular apples need to be harvested at this, this DA reading, you can monitor it and just check on things throughout the whole supply chain. So this is our project. Um, <clears throat> before this one came along, I was actually going out into the orchard, dragging my husband along too, because he was on holidays at the time, <laughs> to, to be my unpaid helper. And just going out there every Tuesday to, oh, so I should acknowledge Kevin Sanders, Sanders Orchard. So it's Kevin, Peter and Bob have been, uh, have been fantastic with giving us a couple of rows of their, their um, orchard there. And some of those rows have been part one half of the row has been sprayed with ethrel, the other half of the row hasn't. We've got a buffer zone in between. So we're monitoring every Tuesday um, 100 fruit from each of these sections and we've got a couple of roads, different parts of the orchard so we can follow it through. Um, <clears throat> John Lepresti's role in this will be to do the regression analyses and to also do a model putting in the climate data as well because as you probably know this year it's been a bit slower with harvest than usual because we haven't had you know, enough sun, we haven't had those 10 degree difference in temperature days to really bring on the colour. So they can, because they uh, colour pick often when they're sending the growers out. Oh sorry, the, um, the pickers out. The pickers have very limited English as well and so really they're just doing a visual pick. So getting, getting the right um, information is important. Um, now we've got sprayed and unsprayed, and then we're putting into these three maturity classes. This is my ideal to have them separated by a 0.1 difference. So this DA meter, um, it, it, the more mature, the it closer it gets to zero. So when I started off in February doing these measurements, we were in the twos, you know, and um, then started, you know, it's basically coming down by 0.1 of a DA um, indicator um, per week. So we're going to try, if we can, and get, harvest will be next week, and get these maturity classes at the one time. If we can't do that, hopefully we can just do it one week apart. Because then the apples 
are going into storage for six months and every probably be every two months we'll take them out and do all these tests that we're doing at the moment. So we'll correlate with ethylene, the amount of sugars, starches, firmness, colour and the, the temperature data obviously is only pre harvest So um, ideally we can get those three classes. If we can't, we'll just have to perhaps bring this one. This is the one we're going to lose, obviously, because as the fruit are maturing, those DA readings start to sort of um, concertina down a bit. Then Kevin is going to get them treated with, commercially treated with MCP or SmartFresh and we'll have treated versus untreated and we'll follow that, um, as I said, through the six months. So I'm just going to show you, this is just from his notebook, this is um, part of my writing, his, etc. Um, so we're going out, we've got our spray, we put them in jars in the field to capture the ethylene for a couple of hours. We take that out into um, um, little tubes that have been evacuated. Then the next day, the Wednesday, uh, we go out to AgriBio and we do the ethylene analysis and all the other starch sugars, etc. out there. So on track, and you know, you can see how he did all this in his own report, right? This was this. So really, it's a pleasure to work with him. And, uh, and then of his own accord, when we do the starch plates, as people call it, with the iodine test, looking at the conversions here. So for example, we've got ethyl sprayed, then we've got the unsprays, and you can see the higher DA readings. Uh, we've got 1.93 in the spray, very similar here, 1.89. So 1.8 or 1.9, there's not they're really that much difference in terms of the DA, but look at the difference in the unsprayed versus the spray. So with these plates, if you're not sure, if you haven't seen these before. The, um, it's an iodine test, basically, and so we're looking at a conversion of the starch in the iodine to the sugars. So the darker, obviously, that's staining for all the starches still. So it's not as uh, it's not as uh, anywhere near near ready. So there is a difference in the spray, but in terms of ethylene, what we're finding so far, there was a burst after that first spray with ethyl, and then it settled back down. So it'd be interesting to just follow this. And that's all much for